Sex and Character. Otto Weininger. 1906. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Second or Principal Part The Sexual Types. Chapter 4. Talent and Genius. There has been so much written about the nature of genius that, to avoid misunderstanding, it will be better to make a few general remarks before going into the subject. And the first thing to do is to settle the question of talent. Genius and talent are nearly always connected in the popular idea, as if the first were a higher, or the highest, grade of the latter, and as if a man of very high and varied talents might be a sort of intermediate between the two. This view is entirely erroneous. Even if there were different degrees or grades of genius, they would have absolutely nothing to do with so-called talent. A talent, for instance the mathematical talent, may be possessed by someone in a very high degree from birth, and he will be able to master the most difficult problems of that science with ease, but for this he will require no genius, which is the same as originality, individuality, and a condition of general productiveness. On the other hand, there are men of great genius who have shown no special talent in any marked degree, for instance, men like Nivalis or Jean Paul. Genius is distinctly not the superlative of talent, there is a worldwide difference between the two, they are of absolutely unlike nature, they can neither be measured by one another or compared to each other. Talent is hereditary, it may be the common possession of a whole family, for example, the Bach family, genius is not transmitted, it is never diffused, but is strictly individual. Many ill-balanced people, and in particular women, regard genius and talent as identical. Women, indeed, have not the faculty of appreciating genius, although this is not the common view. Any extravagance that distinguishes a man from other men appeals equally to their sexual ambition, they confuse the dramatist with the actor, and make no distinction between the virtuoso and the artist. For them the talented man is the man of genius, and Nietzsche is the type of what they consider genius. What has been called the French type of thought, which so strongly appeals to them, has nothing to do with the highest possibilities of the mind. Great men take themselves and the world too seriously to become what is called merely intellectual. Men who are merely intellectual are insincere, they are people who have never really been deeply engrossed by things and who do not feel an overpowering desire for production. All that they care about is that their work should glitter and sparkle like a well-cut stone, not that it should illuminate anything. They are more occupied with what will be said of what they think than by the thoughts themselves. There are men who are willing to marry a woman they do not care about merely because she is admired by other men. Such a relation exists between many men and their thoughts. I cannot help thinking of one particular living author, a blaring, outrageous person, who fancies that he is roaring when he is only snarling. Unfortunately, Nietzsche, however superior he is to the man I have in mind, seems to have devoted himself chiefly to what he thought would shock the public. He is at his best when he is most unmindful of effect. His was the vanity of the mirror, saying to what it reflects, see how faithfully I show you your image. In youth when a man is not yet certain of himself he may try to secure his own position by jostling others. Great men, however, are painfully aggressive only from necessity. They are not like a girl who is most pleased about a new dress because she knows that it will annoy her friends. Genius. Genius. How much mental disturbance and discomfort, hatred and envy, jealousy and pettiness, has it not aroused in the majority of men, and how much counterfeit and tinsel has the desire for it not occasioned. I turn gladly from the imitations of genius to the thing itself and its true embodiment. But where can I begin? All the qualities that go to make genius are in so intimate connection that to begin with any one of them seems to lead to premature conclusions. All discussions on the nature of genius are either biological clinical, and serve only to show the absurd presumption of present knowledge of this kind in its hope to solve a problem so difficult, or they descend from the heights of a metaphysical system for the sole purpose of including genius in their purview. If the road that I am about to take does not lead to every goal at once, it is only because that is the nature of roads. Consider how much deeper a great poet can reach into the nature of man than an average person. Think of the extraordinary number of characters depicted by Shakespeare or Euripides, or the marvelous assortment of human beings that fill the pages of Zola. After the Penicillia, Heinrich von Kleist created Katchen von Heilbronn, and Michelangelo embodied from his imagination the Delphic Sibyls and Alida. There have been few men so little devoted to art as Kant and Schelling, and yet these have written most profoundly and truly about it. In order to depict a man one must understand him, and to understand him one must be like him, in order to portray his psychological activities one must be able to reproduce them in oneself. To understand a man one must have his nature in oneself. One must be like the mind one tries to grasp. It takes a thief to know a thief, and only an innocent man can understand another innocent man. The poser only understands other posers, 
and sees nothing but pose in the actions of others, whilst the simple-minded fails to understand the most flagrant pose. To understand a man is really to be that man. It would seem to follow that a man can best understand himself, a conclusion plainly absurd. No one can understand himself, for to do that he would have to get outside himself, the subject of the knowing and willing activity would have to become its own object. To grasp the universe it would be necessary to get a standpoint outside the universe, and the possibility of such a standpoint is incompatible with the idea of a universe. He who could understand himself could understand the world. I do not make the statement merely as an explanation, it contains an important truth, to the significance of which I shall recur. For the present I am content to assert that no one can understand his deepest, most intimate nature. This happens in actual practice, when one wishes to understand in a general way, it is always from other persons, never from oneself, that one gets one's materials. The other person chosen must be similar in some respect, however different as a whole, and, making use of this similarity, he can recognize, represent, comprehend. So far as one understands a man, one is that man. The man of genius takes his place in the above argument as he who understands incomparably more other beings than the average man. Gouda is said to have said of himself that there was no vice or crime of which he could not trace the tendency in himself, and that at some period of his life he could not have understood fully. The genius, therefore, is a more complicated, more richly endowed, more varied man, and a man is the closer to being a genius the more men he has in his personality, and the more really and strongly he has these others within him. If comprehension of those about him only flickers in him like a poor candle, then he is unable, like the great poet, to kindle a mighty flame in his heroes, to give distinction and character to his creations. The ideal of an artistic genius is to live in all men, to lose himself in all men, to reveal himself in multitudes, and so also the aim of the philosopher is to discover all others in himself, to fuse them into a unit which is his own unit. This protean character of genius is no more simultaneous than the bisexuality of which I have spoken. Even the greatest genius cannot understand the nature of all men at the same time, on one and the same day. The comprehensive and manifold rudiments which a man possesses in his mind can develop only slowly and by degrees with the gradual unfolding of his whole life. It appears almost as if there were a definite periodicity in his development. These periods, when they recur, however, are not exactly alike, they are not mere repetitions, but are intensifications of their predecessors, on a higher plane. No two moments in the life of an individual are exactly alike, there is between the later and the earlier periods only the similarity of the higher and lower parts of a spiral ascent. Thus it has frequently happened that famous men have conceived a piece of work in their early youth, laid it aside during manhood, and resumed and completed it in old age. Periods exist in every man, but in different degrees and with varying amplitude. Just as the genius is the man who contains in himself the greatest number of others in the most active way, so the amplitude of a man's periods will be the greater the wider his mental relations may be. Illustrious men have often been told, by their teachers, in their youth that they were always in one extreme or another. As if they could be anything else. These transitions in the case of unusual men often assume the character of a crisis. Gouda once spoke of the recurrence of puberty in an artist. The idea is obviously to be associated with the matter under discussion. It results from their periodicity that, in men of genius, sterile years precede productive years, these again to be followed by sterility, the barren periods being marked by psychological self-depreciation, by the feeling that they are less than other men, times in which the remembrance of the creative periods is a torment, and when they envy those who go about undisturbed by such penalties. Just as his moments of ecstasy are more poignant, so are the periods of depression of a man of genius more intense than those of other men. Every great man has such periods, of longer or shorter duration, times in which he loses self-confidence, in which he thinks of suicide, times in which, indeed, he may be sowing the seeds of a future harvest, but which are devoid of the stimulus to production, times which call forth the blind criticisms how such a genius is degenerating, how he has played himself out, how he repeats himself, and so forth. It is just the same with other characteristics of the man of genius. Not only the material, but also the spirit, of his work is subject to periodic change. At one time he is inclined to a philosophical and scientific view, at another time the artistic influence is strongest, at one time his intervals are altogether in the direction of history and the growth of civilization, later on it is nature, compare Nietzsche's studies in infinity with his Zarathustra, at another time he is a mystic, at yet another simplicity itself. Björnson and Maurice Maeterlinck are good modern examples, in fact, the amplitude of the periods of famous men is so great, the different revelations of their nature so various, so many different individuals appear in them, that the periodicity of their mental life may be taken almost as diagnostic. 
I must make a remark sufficiently obvious from all this, as to the existence of almost incredibly great changes in the personal appearance of men of genius from time to time. Comparison of the portraits at different times of Gouda, Beethoven, Kant, or Schopenhauer are enough to establish this. The number of different aspects that the face of a man has assumed may be taken almost as a physiognomical measure of his talent. Footnote. I cannot help using the word talent from time to time when I really mean genius but I wish it to be remembered that I am convinced of the existence of a fundamental distinction between talent, or giftedness, and genius. And note. People with an unchanging expression are low in the intellectual scale. Physiognomists, therefore, must not be surprised that men of genius, in whose faces a new side of their minds is continually being revealed, are difficult to classify, and that their individualities leave little permanent mark on their features. It is possible that my introductory description of genius will be repudiated indignantly, because it would imply that a Shakespeare has the vulgarity of his Falstaff, the rascality of his Iago, the boorishness of his Caliban, and because it identifies great men with all the low and contemptible things that they have described. As a matter of fact, men of genius do conform to my description, and as their biographies show, are liable to the strangest passions and the most repulsive instincts. And yet the objection is invalid, as the fuller exposition of the thesis will reveal. Only the most superficial survey of the argument could support it, whilst the exactly opposite conclusion is a much more likely inference. Zola, who has so faithfully described the impulse to commit murder, did not himself commit a murder, because there were so many other characters in him. The actual murderer is in the grasp of his own disposition, the author describing the murder is swayed by a whole kingdom of impulses. Zola would know the desire for murder much better than the actual murderer would know it, he would recognize it in himself, if it really came to the surface in him and he would be prepared for it. In such ways the criminal instincts in great men are intellectualized and turned to artistic purposes as in the case of Zola, or to philosophic purposes as with Kant, but not to actual crime. The presence of a multitude of possibilities in great men has important consequences connected with the theory of Henneds that I elaborated in the last chapter. A man understands what he already has within himself much more quickly than what is foreign to him, were it otherwise there would be no intercourse possible as it is we do not realize how often we fail to understand one another. To the genius, who understands so much more than the average man, much more will be apparent. The schemer will readily recognize his fellow, an impassioned player easily reads the same power in another person, whilst those with no special powers will observe nothing. Art discerns itself best, as Wagner said. In the case of complex personalities the matter stands thus. One of these can understand other men better than they can understand themselves, because within himself he is not only the character he is grasping, but also its opposite. Duality is necessary for observation and comprehension. If we inquire from psychology what is the most necessary condition for becoming conscious of a thing, for grasping it, we shall find the answer in contrast. If everything were a uniform gray we should have no idea of color, absolute unison of sound would soon produce sleep in all mankind, duality, the power which can differentiate, is the origin of the alert consciousness. Thus it happens that no one can understand himself were he to think of nothing else all his life, but he can understand another to whom he is partly alike, and from whom he is also partly quite different. Such a distribution of qualities is the condition most favorable for understanding. In short, to understand a man means to have equal parts of himself and of his opposite in one. That things must be present in pairs of contrasts if we are to be conscious of one member of the pair is shown by the facts of color vision. Color blindness always extends to the complementary colors. Those who are red blind are also green blind, those who are blind to blue have no consciousness of yellow. This law holds good for all mental phenomena, it is a fundamental condition of consciousness. The most high-spirited people understand and experience depression much more than those who are of level disposition. Anyone with so keen a sense of delicacy and subtlety as Shakespeare must also be capable of extreme grossness. The more types and their contrasts a man unites in his own mind the less will escape him, since observation follows comprehension, and the more he will see and understand what other men feel, think, and wish. There has never been a genius who was not a great discerner of men. The great man sees through the simpler man often at a glance, and would be able to characterize him completely. Most men have this, that, or the other faculty or sense disproportionately developed. One man knows all the birds and tells their different voices most accurately. Another has a love for plants and is devoted to botany from his childhood. One man pours lovingly into the many layered rocks of the earth, and has only the vaguest appreciation of the skies, to another the attraction of cold, star-sown space is supreme. One man is repelled by the mountains and seeks the restless sea, another, like Nietzsche, gets no help from the tossing waters and hungers for the peace of the hills. Every man, however simple he may be, 
has some side of nature with which he is in special sympathy and for which his faculties are specially alert. And so the ideal genius, who is all men within him, has also all their preferences and all their dislikes. There is in him not only the universality of men, but of all nature. He is the man to whom all things tell their secrets, to whom most happens, and whom least escapes. He understands most things, and those most deeply, because he has the greatest number of things to contrast and compare them with. The genius is he who is conscious of most, and of that most acutely. And so without doubt his sensations must be most acute, but this must not be understood as implying, say, in the artist the keenest power of vision, in the composer the most acute hearing, the measure of genius is not to be taken from the acuteness of the sense organ but from that of the perceiving brain. The consciousness of the genius is, then, the furthest removed from the henid stage. It has the greatest, most limpid clearness and distinctness. In this way genius declares itself to be a kind of higher masculinity, and thus the female cannot be possessed of genius. The conclusion of this chapter and the last is simply that the life of the male is a more highly conscious life than that of the female, and genius is identical with the highest and widest consciousness. This extremely comprehensive consciousness of the highest types of mankind is due to the enormous number of contrasting elements in their natures. Universality is the distinguishing mark of genius. There is no such thing as a special genius, a genius for mathematics, or for music, or even for chess, but only a universal genius. The genius is a man who knows everything without having learned it. It stands to reason that this infinite knowledge does not include theories and systems which have been formulated by science from facts, neither the history of the Spanish War of Succession nor experiments in diamagnetism. The artist does not acquire his knowledge of the colors reflected on water by cloudy or sunny skies, by a course of optics, any more than it requires a deep study of characterology to judge other men. But the more gifted a man is, the more he has studied on his own account, and the more subjects he has made his own. The theory of special genius, according to which, for instance, it is supposed that a musical genius should be a fool at other subjects, confuses genius with talent. A musician, if truly great, is just as well able to be universal in his knowledge as a philosopher or a poet. Such an one was Beethoven. On the other hand, a musician may be as limited in the sphere of his activity as any average man of science. Such an one was Johann Strauss, who, in spite of his beautiful melodies, cannot be regarded as a genius if only because of the absence of constructive faculty in him. To come back to the main point, there are many kinds of talent, but only one kind of genius, and that is able to choose any kind of talent and master it. There is something in genius common to all those who possess it, however much difference there may seem to be between the great philosopher, painter, musician, poet, or religious teacher. The particular talent through the medium of which the spirit of a man develops is of less importance than has generally been thought. The limits of the different arts can easily be passed, and much besides native inborn gifts have to be taken into account. The history of one art should be studied along with the history of other arts, and in that way many obscure events might be explained. It is outside my present purpose, however, to go into the question of what determines a genius to become, say, a mystic, or, say, a great delineator. From genius itself, the common quality of all the different manifestations of genius, woman is debarred. I will discuss later as to whether such things are possible as pure scientific or technical genius as well as artistic and philosophical genius. There is good reason for a greater exactness in the use of the word. But that may come, and however clearly we may yet be able to describe it woman will have to be excluded from it. I am glad that the course of my inquiry has been such as to make it impossible for me to be charged with having framed such a definition of genius as necessarily to exclude woman from it. I may now sum up the conclusions of this chapter. Whilst woman has no consciousness of genius, except as manifested in one particular person, who imposes his personality on her, man has a deep capacity for realizing it, a capacity which Carlyle, in his still little understood book on hero worship, has described so fully and permanently. In hero worship, moreover, the idea is definitely insisted on that genius is linked with manhood, that it represents an ideal masculinity in the highest form. Woman has no direct consciousness of it, she borrows a kind of imperfect consciousness from man. Woman, in short, has an unconscious life, man a conscious life, and the genius the most conscious life.